So thank you, Priscilla. That was a very nice introduction. It's really a great honor to be here at the University of Michigan, one of the uh, big powerhouses of ecology and evolution in our country and academia, and certainly a wonderful history of uh, uh, natural history and specimen-based research. Uh, you know, starting out with my graduate work in the 1980s, that's actually where I, I met Priscilla. Uh, she was at Texas A&M then, I was at the University of New Mexico. Um, University of Michigan was always one of those places that clearly had produced a phenomenal amount of wonderful research, and much of it uh, being specimen-based. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work uh, in Beringia. As Priscilla mentioned, for 10 years I was at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, working as curator and as a, a professor there at the university, and that's where I really got the bug for high latitude research. Um, I think the title is maybe just a little bit expansive. I'm going to tell you about mammals and and some parasites today. Uh, obviously, there's been a ton of work done on plants and uh, by other labs on mammals as well, but I just want to tell you about a little bit of our work. And the story takes place here in the North Pacific, and uh, we're going to focus on Beringia, uh, which uh, is named after Vitus Bering. Bering Sea is shown there. Uh, this is sort of the scene that we'll be focused on today. Uh, again, named after this fella who uh, was a Danish uh, sea captain, actually, but he was sailing for the Russian uh, Navy. He did two uh, large explorations along the coast of Siberia, and on his second exploration, he actually made landfall in Alaska. And this is the uh, plaque that is on uh, Kayak Island, which is actually right at the tip of his, the top of his uh, boat there, his ship, uh, which is an uh, island just out of Prince William Sound. And so that's where the first landfall was made by somebody who is writing the history. Obviously, humans had been there before, had traveled, and part of the story that I am going to tell today relates to understanding human migration uh, from the Old World into the Americas. Uh, the story of Beringia, though, um, really takes place uh, along the route of this red arrow here, and it is a story that maybe some of you are familiar with uh, in your own lives, and that is a young biologist uh, got his degree and decided uh, that he wanted to go study uh, in Alaska. And so he left Europe and made the overland trip to Tokyo, uh, first, he got married, and he convinced his bride that this would be a great honeymoon to take. So uh, mixing his work with uh, his personal uh, endeavors, they got to Tokyo, and he booked passage on a ship uh, that early the next morning. And so he paid the captain, and they went to bed, and they got up early. The, sh the captain said, be down here at 8 o'clock, and we'll take off. And so they went down at 7 o'clock, and the ship had already taken off with their money. And that was fortunate because as they watched the ship take off, they noticed the steam and the smoke coming off of the ship, and the smoke increased and increased, and the ship caught fire and actually sunk in Tokyo Harbor. Uh, so this is, a, this is a great honeymoon story here. So he booked passage. He convinced her to book passage on the next one, and they booked passage on the next ship headed to Alaska. And that was this ship here, the Commander Beringia, which made it a little farther. It made it out of Tokyo Bay but it foundered off the coast of Kamchatka, which uh, for those of us that are interested in Beringia was a very fortunate thing because for the next, this is where they foundered here in Kamchatka. For the next 18 months, uh, this botanist uh, wasn't, uh, uh, basically t put his plant presses to, to work and he botanized in Kamchatka, always continuing with this effort to make it to Alaska, but another ship didn't come by that he could get on until 18 months later. And so the two of them spent 18 months collecting plants in Kamchatka and then got to Alaska. And when he got to Alaska and started to collect plants and press them, he realized that these were exact same species that he had seen in Kamchatka. And this is where Hultain got the idea that there must have been some sort of a land connection between Asia and North America. So there have been a number of folks uh, that have looked at 
uh, Beringia in different ways. Uh, Bering and his naturalist Steller, of whom some of you might be familiar, a number of things named after him, uh, were there in 1741. In the 1900s, there was Holtain who published his book in 1937, pointing out these uh, similarities between Asia and North America. And then there were folks like Robert Rausch, a famous parasitologist who actually has given my group a lot of insight into looking at Beringia. Uh, but after that, uh, very few biologists. So there were a lot of uh, famous geologists, Dave Hopkins, paleoecologists, uh, and uh, paleontologists uh, from a variety of countries that have focused on this issue of the connection between Asia and North America and what that might have uh, allowed with regard to faunal and floral exchange between these continents. So previous Beringian studies focused on climate variation and its impact on uh, past environments. Uh, obviously, during the Pleistocene, there, were, there was a lot of uh, climate uh, dynamism and uh, past environments changed radically through that time and so paleontologists and geologists were been very interested in sort of reconstructing those environments. Uh, focused on this idea that Beringia was a crossroads, the idea that it was a Bering land bridge, that during the full glacial events when the ice was as much as a mile deep over Canada, uh, the sea levels, uh, because all that water was tied up in ice, had dropped up to uh, over 100 meters in, in depth, and that allowed this high platform between uh, Asia and North America to, uh, to be above water and provide basically a land bridge between Asia and North America. A lot of that work was has been focused on the Pleistocene megafauna, and this was a painting, a very famous painting that was done, um, actually uh, looking out across the Tanana Valley. So if you're at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and looking south, toward the Alaska range there in the back. This was a representation of what that Pleistocene megafauna might have looked like. Uh, a lot of interest in this and the, uh, the environments, whether they were tundra or steppe environments that might have existed at different times uh, during the Pleistocene. Uh, my lab is focused not so much on these large mammals as on, if you look closely, this small little vole that's down here in the bottom because they're actually much easier. Well, none of these things could be sampled today, obviously sample. So uh, along with the parasitologist Eric Holberg and then a series of students, uh, we developed what we called the Beringia Coevolution Project, which was aimed at looking at mammals and their associated parasites and what uh, those organisms might tell us about the history of this connection between Asia and North America. Um, Eric is a was curator of the National Parasite Lab at the USDA in Beltsville. He's retiring actually this month. And so this uh, Beringia Coevolution Project, or BCP, was a specimen-based effort to identify hidden diversity. And when it came to parasites, there was a lot of hidden diversity. To interpret past responses to climate oscillations. To establish baseline sampling for future analyses and to anticipate outcomes of rapid environmental change, which is going, taking place right now in the, in the high latitudes. So it's very, very much what I'm going to tell you today is a, is a museum-based uh, study. The idea being that we're trying to build uh, specimen infrastructure that will allow a lot of different kinds of scientists to ask questions across this broad region. So that entailed a series of grants from the National Science Foundation. All of these grants were for field work. And so we did a phenomenal amount of field work, what we called field surveys, that provided samples for museums. Uh, during these surveys, we had mammologists and parasitologists sitting at the table, uh, which was actually kind of an unusual thing for the way parasitology and mammology has been developed in this country over the last 100 years, where Typically, mammologists would go to the field and throw the parasites away. Parasitologists would go to the field and maybe throw the mammal away. And so they were kind of developed in many ways, except, example, Barry's a good example of someone who didn't do it that way. Uh, these fields were developed in a very disconnected way, unfortunately. Robert Rausch was another one that did it in a very holistic way. We also uh, obtained a lot of specimens by working with state and federal natural resource agencies because they contact a lot of material. Uh, for example, uh, fur 
bearing mammals are still trapped at phenomenal rates at high latitudes. And by working with these agencies, we were able to get carcasses for marten and wolverine and a variety of things on the order of thousands of these things that are collected every year and the parasites from them. So we built archives, and these archives play into informatics. I'm going to talk about informatics a little bit tomorrow. And all of those integrated collections were aimed at the fields of phylogeography, historical biogeography, and the host parasite coevolutionary arena. And underlying all of this are things like global climate change, conservation. We were working again with federal natural resource agencies. A faunal structure, invasive species, and emerging infectious disease. A lot of our work took place working with public health agencies as well. The field work was a tremendous amount of fun from 1999 to 2016. And across this region, as you can imagine, there are not many roads. And so it wasn't really roadside trapping. It was uh, floating down a river. Uh, the picture there in the upper left is a float trip down the Omalon River in Russia. Uh, work in Mongolia, helicopter work, a lot of float plane work, and work out of ships. Uh, so very expensive, and we got a lot of support from federal uh, agencies uh, for this work. These are the sites that we sampled over that period. The green uh, sampling there is uh, the last iteration of the grants that we had. We included a botanist uh, in the work, and uh, these are the sampling, the sampling that he managed to take. The uh, yellow dots are the most recent sampling on that last grant, and the blue dots are sampling from 1999 to 2012. And you can see that the yellow sampling in Russia really fell off about five years ago when politically things got really tough in Siberia. Uh, and so we moved to Mongolia for a lot of our sampling in Asia. If we look at that sampling across time, and so these are five-year periods, 1999 to 2004. Um, and on the bottom, the three boxes that you have there are basically heat diagrams showing you the density of samples from different locations. Uh, for, for example, on that uh, left one there, rodents. And the dark green that you see there are rodents collected during this time period from Alaska. OK, so it's, it's across taxa. And it's across uh, locations, China, Mongolia, Russia, Alaska, Canada, and the contiguous US. Uh, the idea being here that uh, this uh, realization that museums have had recently that our sampling is important not only for biodiversity and not only for spatial uh, uh, analyses, but also now for temporal analyses. And that is, we need to build our archives by sampling the same areas at a regular uh, time period, uh, decade after decade after decade. And that's been shown by the Grinnell Resurvey program. And that is to allow us to look at changes in organisms in biodiversity over time. So this, this idea of looking at change over time has become really central to museums in the last few uh, decades. OK, all of that sampling of specimens allows us to uh, do things like provide information for ecological niche models. And so now, because we have this sampling across this broad region that did not exist before, we can actually build niche models for individual species to see how their distributions have changed in the past. And I'm sure you've seen this kind of, uh, these kinds of studies before from Lacey's lab. And also to project into the future how, under warming conditions, species ranges may change in the future. And so if you look at these series of uh, panels here for two species of shrews, uh, one species, the one in light blue, is a tundra adapted species. The other one in green is a forest adapted species. And these two species are, are close relatives. They're actually sister species that form a contact zone shown in dark blue there. Uh, if we look towards the future, which are the panels on the right here, you can see that the tundra adapted species is going to be forced um, towards the Arctic Ocean. And by uh, 2080, there's going to be very few places left uh, for tundra adapted species. And if you overlay that onto the map on the top left there, where you can see uh, current land use, you can see that the orange there is the Natural Pet National Petroleum Reserve, which was set up 
uh, for Prudhoe Bay, essentially. And next to it, to the right there, uh, in uh, light green, is the Arctic uh, Refuge, which is going to become very important for tundra species going into the future. And of course, if you've been following uh, politics at all lately, you know that the Arctic Refuge was just slipped into the last tax bill that was passed to open that up to, uh, uh, to oil uh, development. So there's a lot of uh, interest here in, in trying to understand how we can protect things like tundra species going into the future given current land use political action. Okay, so over that time period from 1999, we were able to archive 54,000 mammals from this region, representing uh, more than uh, 80 species. And from those specimens, about 14,000 lots of helmets. Um, and many more lots of uh, arthropod uh, of ectoparasites um, and also material to allow us to look at protozoans and viruses. So a pretty extensive set of uh, samples to help us look at uh, mammalian and associated parasite diversity across this region. Our approaches, uh, once we get the samples in my lab, although these uh, samples go to a lot of other labs as well, in my lab, it's uh, phylogenetics to look at diversification, uh, host switching by comparing, for example, phylogenies of parasites to phylogenies of mammals, their hosts. Um, and then in phylogeography and population genetics to identify geographic structure across this broad region, uh, begin to integrate geospatial data like those niche models to give us hypotheses to test, uh, using uh, and looking for demographic signatures of refugia or potentially population expansion. And also to I begin to identify contact zones across this broad region. So I'd like to uh, sort of attack this in, in three, a uh, series of three things under three research themes. The first is this idea that the Beringia was a nexus between the countries, uh, between the continents. And again, there had been a lot of paleontological work, but there had been uh, very little molecular genetic work done looking at populations on uh, on either side of the uh, Bering Strait. And that's simply because the specimens weren't, exam weren't available. Then I want to talk a little bit about the role of Beringia as a uh, refugium, as a potential cradle in the high Arctic, allowing and promoting Arctic diversification. Um, and uh, relate a little bit about the interaction between climate change and landscapes, because across this vast region, we have some phenomenal mountain ranges and including the tallest uh, mountain in North America, that will also shape uh, the way uh, species are structured. And then uh, close with uh, talking a little bit about parasites and host parasite dynamics under cyclic climates. Okay, so as of uh, last year, uh, we put together a little summary of the publications that had come out of this work since 1994, since 1999, based on the sampling. There was a total of 174 pubs at that point. And we basically took key words and the words in the titles to try and see what uh, the major themes were that were coming out of these publications. And of course, as you would predict, there are things like vol and cestodes. The lines between these, there's, there's four main areas that were defined in this analysis, shown by the four colors. And the lines sort of connect the themes together. So this is the idea of trying to integrate across different research themes or across different taxa, for example. Um, and as you can see, the things that kind of came to the top were the things that uh, my graduate students were working on uh, because they did most of the work uh, or other graduate students. And so it's things like focus on voles, on uh, associated parasites of voles, climate change, um, a variety of things related to, if you look at the blue one up there, uh, variation, for example, really trying to characterize variation across this vast region. Refugia pops up. We targeted, I'm going to target today for you uh, a few examples that comes from that work. Um, and with regard to the Bering Land Bridge, we're going to look at rodents, uh, voles, lemmings, and squirrels, mustelid carnivores, sebolophyme nematodes, and a rostroleopard and paranophocephalid cestodes. Again, the overriding 
uh, feature here in the north and over the past two and a half million years has been ice. You get these large glaciers and when you had the full glacial advances, the sea levels dropped, which allowed exchange between Asia and uh, Alaska. Uh, when the glaciers receded, that allowed for colonization within the continents, but it made a disconnect between the two continents. You folks have all seen uh, these figures before, just showing that there were a number, more than 20 of these major glacial advances during the Pleistocene and that the amplitude of those uh, glaciers really ramped up in the last uh, 600,000 years. Uh, this is the region that we're going to focus on in the red uh, dot there. That's uh, sort of the limits of Beringia. And as you can see on the Asian or western border, there wasn't really an ice sheet. And so the potential for movement or the potential for source populations was very different in Asia than it was in North America. In North America, Alaska was effectively a part of Asia for much of the Pleistocene. And when we look at the genetics of a lot of Alaska uh, species, uh, that, that bears out. Uh, you can see that uh, Alaska uh, really was a part of the old world for much of, of that period. And with a very hard barrier from it to the rest of the Americas. Okay, so was it a continental crossroads? Long suspected, and we have you know distributional data just by looking at mammals that suggests that. Uh, but it hadn't it had been tough to test because the specimens weren't available. So the questions we can ask with regard to exchange are number one, who made it across? Who was ex uh, what species were exchanged, and what sort of a filter was in place? And uh, during the Pleistocene, it, the filtering uh, clearly seemed to be primarily temperate and Arctic species that moved. There wasn't, uh, and even among temperate species, there were very few forest adapted species that, that made it across this, um, this bridge. Uh, what direction did, did organisms move? Was it asymmetric, primarily to the east or to the west, or was it symmetric? Uh, when did species move, and how many times did they move? So what was the history of colonization, and what was the sequence? So if we look at uh, the genus Microtus, this is a vole, worldwide distribution, so a whole Arctic uh, genus with about 44 species in the old world and 20 plus in the new world, and only one species that is today is found whole Arctically. And so we can ask the question within this genus, how many colonizations were there of the new world? The fossil record suggests that they have an old world origin. And so you can build a phylogeny um, for the microtus, and this is a phylogeny that was done a long time ago based on mitochondria that has actually not been retested, so it's out there for somebody to retest with nuclear genes. But based on this phylogeny, all the North American voles uh, form a clade, uh, form a, a group suggesting a single colonization deep in the past history of of this genus. And then there was a second colon, colonization that took place by Microtus economus, uh, that short red bar that you see there, which is the species that is whole arctic. It's found on both sides. And so it made the colonization event much more recently across the, across the uh, bridge. Okay, so that's the, that's the node there that defines all of the North American microtus species as a single clade. We can do that for squirrels. Uh, this is higher level. So these are, this is the tribe Marmatini. This is based on a UCE analysis, which is just, which is uh, in submission right now. Um, and this is at a deeper level. So we're looking now at a number of genera. And uh, the take home point here is the color coding is, is uh, blue is old world and uh, brown is new world. And you can see that the blue pops up repeatedly throughout this. So for the Marmatines, there must have been multiple colonizations that took place across the Bering Land Bridge. Okay, this is the way we would use a phylogeny to show that. Today we have only a single species out of this whole group that is found across, uh, that is whole Arctic, that is found on both sides of the Bering Strait, and that's uh, 
uh, the ground squirrel perii that's shown in, uh, if you look out the edge there, it's shown in blue and uh, hatching brown, Eurocepelus perii. Okay, so if we look across a number of species, um, we can tally up whether the movement was primarily uh, westward or eastward. Um, and as it turns out, as you might predict based on the ice, uh, most of the species moved from Asia into North America. And this had actually been predicted by Robert Rausch in 1994 based on parasite evidence. And so overwhelmingly, species have moved from Asia into North America over the last uh, two and a half million years. Okay, so that's the direction of movement. The question of when did they move can also be tracked, but to get accurate timing um, on uh, our divergence estimates, we really need to have multiple genes because with a single gene you have very large uh, variance. And so uh, this is an example here where of, of actually just a single gene. This is a mitochondrial gene. It was estimated across a number of arvicoline species or species pairs that shows for species pairs, uh, and these are species pairs on either side of the Bering uh, Strait, uh, the divergence can be very, very deep, as much as two and a half million years or one and a half million years for dichrostomics. Uh, but then when you look within species, you can see that the coalescent estimates fall within these most recent uh, glacial events. And so slowly what we're doing is we're accumulating information across these different species to try and figure out what species were making it across the Bering la Land Bridge at what time to give us some indication based on their ecology then of what the environments might have looked like and also uh, cross-matching that with uh, paleoecological information. Okay, so was the movement of colonizing species primarily west to east as proposed by Rausch? Yes. Was the sequence of geographic colonization what was the sequence of colonization and how many events are represented for particular taxa, this is really highly variable and it's gonna take a lot of additional work and actually a lot of uh, additional genes for us to be able to refine these estimates of when colonization took place. Um, so there's more work to do on that front. Okay, with regard to this idea that Beringia as a refugium might have been a cradle that spawned a lot of new diversity for the Arctic as proposed by Andre Scher in 1999. We can look at this question um, and focus on whether it, it, when we look at a number of species, we find clades that are centered on this area. So if Beringia as a refugium was producing new diversity, we might suspect that a number of clades would be sort of centered right here. And we would also predict that contact zones as these species moved out of Beringia and recolonized either Asia or North America following the recession of ice, that the contact zones should be at the borders of Beringia. And so the prediction here is that contact zones should fall at those boundaries. And so we've done that for a number of species. And as we pile up the examples, again, this takes really extensive sampling to get it where the location of contact zones are. The contact zones begin to shake out as for a number of species, particularly those that are sort of high latitude focused uh, to be centered on the edge of Beringia, either in the McKinsey Mountains or in Asia on, the, on your left there um, along the Omalon and Koma, uh, Koloma rivers or maybe over e even as far as the Lena. The boundary of Beringia in Asia has been debated as either the Lena River or the o o Omalon. Okay, so if we look at, begin to look at geographic structure within a species, this is uh, Lemus. You can see that in Lemus there is a clade, this clade labeled uh, B there for Beringia, that is clearly centered on Beringia, and the edge of those clades fall right on the edges of where we, would, where we predict this refuge extended. Okay, with another clade meeting it at the McKinsey Mountains, in North America and clade C, which is the Central Asia clade meeting uh, this Beringian clade on the Kolomar River. If we go back to the voles and look at that one whole Arctic species, which is in and of itself sort of centered uh, on Beringia, although it extends to the east and west both, we can see that one of the clades of Microtus economus, this tundra vole, falls clearly uh, centered on Beringia with uh, uh, 
a contact zone in Asia along the Omalon River, uh, or predicted contact zone along the Omalon River with the Central Asian clade for this species. And there are no clades further uh, east in North America. So as I mentioned earlier, we floated the Omalon River. And as they floated the Omalon River and collected samples there, they discovered that they had uh, individuals that had mitochondria of the Central Asian or CA uh, clade and a nuclear marker of the Central Asian clade. But as they worked their way further uh, south, they began to pick up mitochondria of the Beringia clade that was mixed with uh, the nuclear marker for the Central Asian clade. And so again, this was uh, a demonstration, uh, albeit uh, still very rough, that these two clades are in contact along this river and exchanging genes. Um, how about just diversity within Beringia? And as it turns out, we talk about, or I've talked about Beringia as being a single uh, refugium, but clearly there was a, a fair amount of substructure within that, as you might suspect, given the tremendous amount of topographic relief that we have just in Alaska itself. And so when we look at something like Arctic ground squirrels, you can see that there's a tremendous amount of phylogeographic structure that uh, occurs that probably has developed uh, while this refugium was exposed with some of those clades extending across the Bering uh, land bridge and across the Bering Strait. So, and some of those clades, for example, even having a disjunct distribution suggesting probably a southern connection at some time in the past. The two red uh, circles there are the same clade, but they have a disjunct distribution across uh, the Bering Strait. Uh, similarly, a lot of phylogeographic structure has been shown for other mammals. Uh, Haley Lanier uh, has shown a uh, similar or a little bit different kind of structure, but structure within uh, pikas in the same general area. Okay, ermine. Uh, turned out to be a very interesting story. Uh, three clades were initially defined uh, based on a graduate student I had in the 1990s at Fairbanks. Uh, and the three clade, the distribution of the three clades was a little surprising. And so the three clades are shown in three colors here. Uh, one is what we call the whole Arctic clade, and it extends from uh, one island in southeast Alaska down by Juneau. Uh, across central Alaska, and then all the way across to Asia, all the way to Ireland, um, and down to Japan. Another clade was found only in southeast Alaska, and this is the one shown in green there on Prince of Wales Island, Hecate Island, Sumez, and down in the Queen Charlottes in British Columbia. And then the third clade, which has since been broken up into two other clades, uh, was found in North America and was what we call the continental clade. And the contact between the whole Arctic and the North American clade is right at the edge of Beringia, so right at the Yukon-Alaska border. So here's another example of where those contacts are popping up where we would predict. So if we map those uh, distributions out, and this is a polar projection, so you kind of got to get your head around this, uh, where the whole Arctic is with the line coming down, that's Kamchatka there, and where the island is in the western you're over in North America there, and you can maybe make out Alaska. So one clade has this very, very broad distribution and not a lot of uh, variation actually within that clade, so obviously a fairly rapid expansion. Uh, then you have the continental clade, you have a western clade, which is a new one we picked up, and then a very distinctive island clade. So this is one that uh, we've been fortunate enough to uh, to have funds to actually look at a genome level. And so the tricky thing is what I've been telling you about here has been based on uh, preliminary work based on very few markers, which don't really allow us to get at cyclic events. And uh, what we would predict is that because these glacials cycled multiple times, that the species would have come into contact multiple times. And so we really need uh, the technology to be able to get at past introgression, if possible. And genomes allow us to do that now, as some of you might be familiar with the polar bear brown bear example. Uh, so uh, we picked individuals uh, from the ermine clades, and uh, those are shown on the top bar there. This is the, that's the worldwide distribution. 
So to represent the whole Arctic clade, we picked a sample from Mongolia. Uh, the two gray, the two gray crosses that you see up there actually turned out to be hybrids that we picked up in the hybrid zone. And so that box there is repeated down below. And what the box that's shown is Alaska Yukon Territory. And so we were very fortunate to pick up individuals that actually showed uh, hybridization taking place. And then there's another black box that's, that's on the KUP uh, red uh, uh, cross that's there. And that box is shown here as the NPC contact. And so this is a, this is a blow up of southeast Alaska. And as it turns out, in southeast Alaska, three of these clades come together. So across this worldwide distribution, in southeast Alaska itself, three clades come together, and only one of those clades is found in southeast. And when we look at that blue clade, shown there as a blue cross in POW on Prince of Wales Island, um, as it turns out, it's most closely related when we build a tree to the Beringia clade. And so these two trees, one trees, one's the mitochondrial genome, the other is the autosomal SNPs showing you that the SNPs uh, don't agree with the mitochondrial genome, sort of pointing out that the uh, YT, AK, and SYT are hybrid individuals. Uh, the NPC, which is the, the, the restricted clade to southeast Alaska, is closest to Beringia. But when we uh, place that on, uh, uh, we actually, on a PCA, we can show that the SYT and the YTK, which are those two recent hybrids at the hybrid zone between Alaska and Yukon, fall between the Beringian and the Eastern clades, which is what you would predict for a hybrid. But the NPC also falls in the middle of those. And so what we suspect we have with this NPC clade is an ancient hybridization event that has endured through the last glacial uh, maximum in a coastal refugium. And the ermine actually has been the best example we've had yet of this hypothetical and very controversial coastal refugium, which is a refugium that was predicted um, off the coast of British Columbia and southeast Alaska and would obviously play a very important part in uh, the colonization of the lower Americas by humans if there was a refugium that persisted during the glacial during the glacial ice ages and humans were colonizing the lower 48 via the, an ocean route. So, so one of the big controversies about humans being able to colonize the lower 48 via an ocean route was the idea that they couldn't make it along this long stretch of glacial, of tidewater glacials. And now it appears that from this evidence and from um, evidence from uh, plants and a number of other organisms that they're probably probably was a glacial refugium. Okay, so with regard to Beringia as a cradle, there are common breaks that define clades and zones of contact. In Asia, this is at the omalon Coloma region. In North America, this is roughly along the Yukon-Alaska border, and these about the McKinsey Mountains, and these uh, correspond to those edges of Beringia. And we also have a more complicated story now in that we have other refugia that are beginning to come into play that are also adding into uh, understanding the generation of diversity at, at high latitudes. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, very seldom do we see a significant genetic break at the Bering Strait. So if we were just to take a look at the map today and say, where would you predict to see for a species that is found on either side of the Bering Strait a genetic break, you would predict that at the Bering Strait, but that doesn't really hold up, suggesting that, again, as we know from uh, geology, that their connection persisted until just 10,000 years ago. Okay, host parasites. Um, I'm going to give you just a few examples. This is Cibola phimi bacherini, which is, you know, this very large nematode. You can see a picture of it there that's found in the gut, primarily of Martin. It does spill over into Wolverine and ermine and a few other things and actually is also shows up in shrews. Um, uh, but primarily Martin, um, it can be, uh, have a very high intensity. We've taken as many as 200 out of a stomach. When you build a, a, a network 
uh, for this worm across this vast region, you can see that there is a break between Asia and North America, but it's not a very big break. Each one of those dots represents a mutation. Uh, but if you look at the black box that's blown up there, you can see that in southeast Alaska, there's a tremendous amount of deep variation that's shown in this worm. And uh, we suggest that this worm basically is perhaps another, provides another signature of a deeper history of evolution uh, in this coastal refugium. Uh, and there's a very interesting backstory with this worm because uh, in southeast Alaska there are two species of Martin. Uh, prior to our work there, it was, a, it was considered to be a single species. One of the species is endemic and clearly appears to be another example of uh, perhaps a coastal form and it would be the one that would have supported this uh, nematode. Okay, Rostrolepis horida. Uh, this was considered to be a single species across the high Arctic. Uh, so it's a parasite of voles and lemmings. It uh, shows substantial morphological variation. And so recent descriptions of new Rostrolepis species suggested there was some hidden diversity there. And so as we began to collect the samples and look uh, based on molecular evidence, uh, in this case, this is the mitochondrial, uh, tree, we can see that there's significant structure that's found in what was considered to be a single species across a number of genera of uh, arvicolines and with a lot of examples of host switching across those genera. Uh, so this tree was tested with a nuclear tree. The same sort of structure showed up, suggesting that, uh, in fact, the Rostrolepis is probably a composite of a number of species. And so uh, those species have since been described. Uh, this is the distribution of those species. The, each color is a different species across this region. So you can see significant uh, uh, geographic uh, distribution of the different species, what was previously considered a single one. Uh, so similar uh, story with a different uh, cestode, Paranophilocephala omphaloides again considered to be a single species prior to our work and this work was done in collaboration uh, with a Finnish group, uh, Heike Hintonen and Voito Halkasalmi and their stu graduate students uh, uh, through a series of papers showing both molecular work as well as, as uh, morphological work. They uh, have described now uh, more than 24 species and five new genera from what was a single species. And all of these species descriptions for both Rostrolepis and Paranophilocephala are accompanied by morphological descriptions. And so really nice uh, set of work showing that what we thought across the Arctic was fairly low diversity is in fact uh, very, very high diversity. And that has popped up again and again. Okay, so the Ice Ages clearly fragmented population, uh, and when populations were fragmented, uh, that stimulated diversification. When the ice receded and the populations were able to come back into contact, at some point, in some cases, there was exchange, exchange of genes, perhaps exchange of parasites. Uh, the Bering Land Bridge uh, clearly was a crossroads. Uh, there are very few deep relationships that we picked up that show these transberingian sister relationships, and then uh, the shallow, close genetic relationships are picked up, particularly in the whole arctically distributed species. Beringia was a cradle uh, that spawned uh, new uh, variation. So we show that it's a center of endemism for both hosts and parasites. Um, other refugia around the edges of this add complexity to the story. And uh, with the ermine, we have the first mammal that lends support to the coastal refugium hypothesis. And then we have a series of uh, smaller northern ref refugia um, in northern Canada, and then uh, southern refugia, some of those obviously very large, that also contributed to the mix of species that we have at high latitudes now uh, within the last 10,000 years. We have uh, many new helmet species and genera that have been described and, again, identified we're just beginning to unravel the significant phylogeographic structure that is found across the Arctic. So next steps 
Uh, obviously, there's a transition to much more intensive lab work. Um, and of course, that entails uh, new grants to support development of new genomes. Uh, but a uh, lot of potential with genome approaches to begin to unravel the complexity of, of this cyclic climatic history. Um, there are exciting new ways of combining genes and GIS, some of them championed by uh, your department. Um, we are, with additional genes, able to revi refine our views of rates of divergence uh, across this region, and so really refine our understanding of what took place at different time periods, and uh, then to begin to develop uh, more powerful comparative approaches. But all of these require really geographically extensive and site-intensive collections. And I, I think I just would like to emphasize the point that we don't have those collections yet. There's still a phenomenal amount of uh, field work that needs to take place to get us to the point where uh, we can have uh, really rigorous studies. Okay, so this work was done on the backs of a lot of graduate students at three different institutions. Um, the one at the top left there is Idaho State when I was there. This fellow over here was a master's student who worked on the Cibola Fami Anson who went on later to get his PhD in New Zealand. Um, this picture here I'd like to point out is in Alaska and it's that same view looking south towards the Alaska Range taken from the museum there. And the uh, woman in the middle is Allison Bidlack, who was an uh, undergraduate in your department a few decades ago, and she went on, did a master's with me, and got a PhD at Berkeley, and she's now director of the Coastal Rainforest Center in Juneau, Alaska. The thing I like about that picture is, if you look closely at it, you can figure out at what stage of the graduate program each of those students is. Uh, clearly, uh, John Dembowski was about to finish, and he'd had enough. And Amy Runk over here on the right uh, hasn't got a clue as to what's coming down the line for her. And then this picture at the Duck Pond is my students in Albuquerque. And then this is my most recent lab picture here. So thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm probably not the right person to ask that. Um, I don't know. Barry might be able to help us with that. Uh, but I I would suspect. So it's a great question because morphologically with these cestodes, for example, they don't have a lot of characters to work with. Although, as I pointed out, uh, Voito, the, the Finnish fellow that worked with this, was able to pick up morphological characters for all of the species that were defined molecular, from a molecular standpoint. So they have fewer characters to work with. Um, I think that really uh, the sense here is, and it, it's always sort of been the way I think we've taught uh, biogeography is that, you know, the great big Arctic up there is not very diverse and it's all pretty much the same thing and that we just haven't hadn't looked at it very, very carefully. And I think that's, it's probably a combination of both those things. Uh, I think as people probably look at cestodes in the tropics, they're going to describe a lot of new species too. Uh, we don't have a lot of taxonomists to do that kind of work for starters. And so, you know, this is, I was really fortunate to find the people that could actually do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I just had a, I showed you that work on the squirrels. And uh, I had a PhD student finish up, uh, Brian McLean, who did a lot of morphological work, um, both related to taxonomy, but also related to sort of evolutionary trends and characters. Um, and so uh, not as much of that work is taking place as should. I think that, you know, mammologists are probably going to return to, to that. I think that the new technologies we have with regard to CT scanning and so forth are going to provide a lot of great new uh, characters and information uh, that will allow to, us to get at some of that stuff. But uh, 
Like with the ermine, no, we haven't followed up, and that is an obvious one that needs to be looked at. For sure. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so so you know the the paradigm, the old paradigm in parasitology was this Fahrenholtz rule that co-diversification or co-speciation should be the rule, and so when the hosts uh, speciate, the parasite should as well. And I think that that has really been challenged by a lot of the work that has come out over the last few decades by a lot of labs that have done sort of host and parasite comparisons. Um, as far as a mechanism, I. Uh, uh, Eric Hoberg, who I work with, has has uh, just written a book, and um, that is in review right now. That's uh, 500 pages long, so it'll be a good read for you. Where he has proposed a whole series of mechanisms related to uh, things such as episodic climatic events, uh, ecological fitting, um, and uh, the fact that with all this dynamism, you're clearly bringing a lot of different hosts into contact repeatedly. And so what is that? What are the conditions that make it right for, for parasites to switch? So he's laid out sort of a whole paradigm with regard to using these data, actually, to sort of set up how that might occur. And uh, I think I, I, rather than try to give you the whole picture on that, um, I'll just point you to this book that's coming out at the University of Chicago uh, pretty soon. Um, I know given my experience in working with Eric that it's going to be quite a read. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, they clearly pull in the fact of the, the climate, the episodes of climate change being really important uh, at promoting collision of different faunas, which then allows opportunities for host switching to take place. And the idea that you sort of have to find a host that sort of is ecologically similar to the one that you're at. That you're at. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, so we collected a lot of mammals and we did it intensively at different sites, but as you know, from field work, you can spend a lot of days at a place and miss things, right? And so you can't, it's really hard to get at what's missing. And I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. Uh-huh. Uh, missing it from, say, uh-huh. Um, yeah, so, I, if, as far as missing from the center of a distribution, probably not that I could point to right now. Certainly, uh, we are seeing, like southeast Alaska, still a lot of dynamic colonization going on. So, for example, moose have moved into southeast Alaska within the last 80 years and have just recently colonized some of the outer islands. And so they've slowly been colonizing islands. And so we're seeing that with, with uh, other species as well that are coming into southeast Alaska down the big river corridors. So if you're talking about sort of at the edges of species distributions, um, there are things that you would predict based on other species that are there that they should be there, that they're not there yet. Uh, we see some of that. I, I'm not sure if that's what you're getting at, but from the center of a range, I, I don't know of any examples like that, per se. Okay. Sure. I'm surprised. <laughs> right. Uh huh. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you, to you about that tonight at dinner. Actually, <laughs> my grad student that, that produced those data, Jossie, who's there in the middle, said, "This is the question you've got to ask Priscilla," and it's just on that topic. Yeah.